These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. While the show is still on hiatus, there are a number of topics, both big and small, that I never really got a chance to cover during Season 1, but which I would like to look at before we get into Season 2. Various aspects of Bronze Age life, history, and culture that never made it in. As far as most archaeologists are concerned, today's topic is on the smaller end of things, a matter for trivia and brief facts. But as far as I'm concerned, the matter of games, play, and gambling is probably far more significant for the majority of people in Mesopotamia than the affairs of kings and wars that we usually focus on. Really, up until now, this show has looked a bit at how the people of the Bronze Age Near East lived and worked, as well as how they worshipped, but mostly it's been focused on how and why they killed each other and who was in charge during the occasional years of peace. What we have barely looked at so far is the question of how the ancient Mesopotamians had fun, assuming, of course, that the endless wars were not, in fact, how they had fun. In a 30-day month, the typical Babylonian calendar had 18 days that were designated as working days, with six holy days, three lunar festivals, and three resting days. Comparing that to a modern 30-day month, which averages 22 working days and only eight weekends, maybe a holiday thrown in there as well, a laborer in Babylon may have had a bit more time to relax and have fun than does a modern worker. Though, without the internet, television, or video games, it can be hard to imagine that they had any reason at all to look forward to those days off. Play, then as now, began with babies. Nowadays, most Western babies are sat in front of iPads or television screens to grow up completely digitally. This is not the origin of all modern evils, as some people would have us believe, but it will almost certainly contribute to the downfall of modern civilization in the near future. In the post-apocalyptic hellhole that we leave behind, the irradiated babies of the future will spend their time in much the same way that ancient babies did, in play. At sites throughout the Near East, and indeed throughout the world, archaeologists have found toys for children to play pretend with, miniature versions of familiar everyday objects. In Mesopotamia, this includes a large number of four-legged animals made of clay by clearly amateur hands, the work of eager parents whose love for their children exceeds their technical skill in clay, leaving us sometimes unable to tell if the four-legged blobs are meant to be dogs, sheep, cattle, goats, or whatever else. I don't say this to be critical, but rather to show the humanity of these rather ugly but surely beloved clay toys. When I myself once tried to make a horse out of clay, it resembled these ancient artifacts rather closely in its lack of skill. Of course, there are some exceptional pieces as well, made by clearly skilled clay workers. But perhaps counterintuitively, the better the craftsmanship of any given animal figure, the more likely we are to assume that it is in fact not a toy, but rather a statue for use in decoration, or as a clay proxy for a religious ritual. It is those animals that barely look like animals at all, clumsily made by the weary hands of an exhausted father after a long day making bricks or harvesting barley, that are the best representations of what the typical Mesopotamian toddler held in their hands and waved in the air while making sound effects. Moo, moo, While we generally expect that richer kids had nicer toys, we find that generally the figurines tend to fall into certain categories, domestic and military. Tiny wagons, beds, tables, and dolls would help children enact domestic scenes in their imaginations, while tiny chariots, ships, and toy soldiers could be sent on fanciful and hopefully bloody adventures. We can only wonder how many sand ziggurats were piled up in the abundant dirt of Sumer and warred over or lived in. 
Of course, a great deal of playing pretend was likely also done either without props or by borrowing the real tools of the adults of the house, and leaves no mark in the historical record. Though we know that since Sumerian babies were just as human as modern children, this sort of role-playing would have formed a crucial part of their mental development, just as it does today. Only instead of playing TSA agent or TikTok star or whatever modern babies do with their times, these ancient children were imagining themselves as brick bakers, parents, and pastoralists instead. Exercise also plays a key role in the play of children, then and now, facilitating the emulation of their adult role models, building physical skills for the future, and working off all that excess energy most children have in abundance. For the very earliest children, archaeology has revealed rattles of clay filled with beans or pebbles to make fun noises, as well as other things that could have been other sorts of noise makers or toys to shake around for the infants. As they grew older, they could advance to spinning tops, assorted balls, and jumping rope, the latter of which was apparently enjoyed by the goddess Ishtar, and children may have had jump rope songs in which the goddess was honored, much like the jump rope games of school children nowadays, but with a giant sex goddess as the object of the rhymes. Boys picked up sticks and hit each other with them, but there were also juvenile-sized slingshots, bows, and other weaponry so that children could enjoy the thrill of violence from the very youngest ages, just like nowadays, but with fewer safety warnings. Of course, even children who couldn't afford a stick off the ground could still play in the oldest animal games of the human race. A child alone can run, Indeed, an adult can run as well, we hope. And introducing more participants to the activity can turn the running into a race. Foot races were everything from informal fun to subjects for gambling, and they could extend anywhere from short sprints to the nearest tree to endurance races from one city to another. Now, did they expand this running into games like tag or hide and seek? There's no evidence for it, but there's no real reason to think they didn't have some variation on the basic idea of running after each other. As the boys grew older, these improvised contests may not have been satisfying enough, and we have many, many artistic depictions of wrestling contests pretty much throughout all of Mesopotamian civilization, from the Epic of Gilgamesh's description of Gilgamesh and Enkidu wrestling for seven days straight, all the way to relief carvings of wrestlers in the last days of Babylon. Modern scholars look at the various artistic depictions and break these combat sports into a wrestling analog and a boxing analog, neither of which have any clear rules that have survived until today, and almost certainly there were local variants of all these combat sports that each prevailed as a standard in different times and places. That said, they do seem to have rarely been fatal, so they were likely restricted in some way or another, much like modern boxing and wrestling, but the details have never been found in writing. Aside from combat sports, there must also have been more conventional sports, though these two are difficult to say too much about. Most famously, we know from the Epic of Gilgamesh that there was, at one time, a popular game that involved hitting a ball with a paddle or mallet. Though whether this was some sort of soccer-type game, just with bats instead of kicks, or if it was more like golf, or even perhaps some early version of cricket, well, that's debated, and we honestly don't really have any details about that. And of course, the game or at least the basic tools, may have evolved into multiple different kinds of games, with the same equipment being used for many different purposes in different places. And it's possible that maybe both sides of the debate are right. Uh, maybe it was they had a soccer version of the game, maybe they had a golf version of the game, or it's also equally possible that everyone's wrong, and that the bat and ball were used for some wholly different purpose that no one's really thought of in modern times. 
In one variation, it may have even involved players stacked upon each other's shoulders, one batsman up top and one person on bottom acting as the legs. Though whatever was going on in this variant is even less certain than whatever the standard variant was. I should note that we do have scattered references to a paddle and ball game written down in a number of places, so something must have existed, and it wasn't simply a literary invention of the Epic of Gilgamesh. There is some slight artistic representation of wrestling and other games that involve also depictions of musicians, mostly drummers accompanying the action. Now, this drum may have been to give signals, like three drums to start, three drums to stop, something, who knows. But it also may have been to provide musical background. You know, everything's more exciting with background music. Or it may depict the fact that these games were sometimes played in the context of a larger festival or feast, where music, food, games, and even performers of various kinds could be present. And we should not lose sight of the fact that, though eating and drinking have always been basic biological requirements, they're also often entertainments in themselves. The common folk may not have been able to feast on the same level that the kings sometimes did, but they still held feasts for the holidays, weddings, and for other special occasions. Even if the fair was no more than a bit of maybe bread and, you know, dates if you're lucky. Communal eating all by itself can be pleasant, and when you add to it the gossiping, drinking, gambling, impromptu games, and singing that could accompany any Bronze Age block party, a holiday among the poor could well have been a good time for all. Of course, now what's a feast without beer to go along with it? Anatolia, the Levant, and the tables of the wealthy all over the world could have well featured fruit wines of various sorts. They grew that sort of stuff around there and was generally available for import if you had enough money. But the staple for drinking in Mesopotamia was beer. Now, contrary to common assertion, beer was not, in fact, required for cleaning water. Uh, there's, there's this notion in some people's head that people drank beer 100% of the time because the water would immediately kill you if you so much as accidentally sipped it. And this is uh, comical nonsense. Uh, if it was ever true at any point in history, it was not true among the ancient Mesopotamians because they had the Tigris and the Euphrates and its many tributaries with plenty of access to quality potable water, and they had a good sense of when wells were pure or when they were spoiled. Still, they drank a ton of beer. And this it really isn't something that needs the sort of deep explanation, oh, they couldn't drink the water, it's, it's and antiseptic, you gotta have the beer to purify the water. No, no, you don't need that kind of pop historian explanation. They drank beer because it fills you up and it tastes good. And because if you drink enough, you get intoxicated. Beers in Mesopotamia typically ranged from 2 to 4 percent alcohol, low enough that anyone in society could enjoy the taste without worrying about impairment, and high enough that someone who wanted to get smashed had that option. These early beers were very much liquid bread, in the very literal sense of the term. Many started with a loaf of dry barley to get the uh, yeasts and, and bacteria started. I don't know how you make bread. Uh, then they had more barley and water added to it there. No hops, I would add. Those would not be invented until much later. Invented? Discovered? I don't know. I don't drink. Beer is a mystery to me. Exact recipes were local and traditional, varying from place to place and family to family. Beer production was everywhere, from household scale all the way up to nationwide industrial factories, and often included in ration payments to soldiers, laborers, and officials. Date wine may not have been uncommon in Mesopotamia, and grape wine and other fruit alcohols were common in other places, those places being 
the places where grapes and other fruits were grown. But for the most part, beer was fully integrated into every level of society and consumed on a regular basis. Water, just plain water from wells or from rivers, was drunk even more often than beer for purposes of hydration. You know, water is good for you. But beer was generally preferred and could even be drunk out of extremely long straws made of reed. In fact, we have depictions of uh, people drinking communally out of a jar that is full of beer and they're really sharing one giant jar of beer and they each stick reed straws which may have been as long as six feet long so that they can drink out of these communal jars and they really look very silly but you know I guess a bunch of people sitting in a bar look silly too. All that beer then could easily give way to singing. Anthropologists have proposed that singing may in fact predate spoken language in early humans, and we see song most prominently in a religious context. These religious songs could be accompanied by stringed instruments, which resembled lutes and harps, wind instruments, which were simple reed flutes, and drums of various shapes to produce various sounds. The extent to which these instruments were used in secular entertainment is debated, with some insisting that many of these instruments were only ever used for religious purposes, or sometimes at the king's court for very highbrow entertainments. To my mind, it seems absurd to think that a person who has put the effort in to learn an instrument would never have called to use it at just, you know, a party with friends, and we know of secular music for singing, like drinking songs and praises of kings. Almost certainly, at least the simpler sorts of instruments could be created and played by pretty much any enthusiastic layperson, and the fields, streets, and common dinner tables of ancient Mesopotamia undoubtedly rang out in amateur, joyful song from time to time. Now, what those songs sounded like is really almost completely unknowable. All we have today are a few tiny fragments of ancient religious music whose reconstruction is highly uncertain, even if there are a ton of YouTube channels claiming to have reconstructed the world's oldest music. And anyway, even if they did reconstruct these ancient religious hymns, the relation between that and the common music of the age may have been as separate as Gregorian chant is from rock and roll. Uh, but somewhere along here we have slid from play into entertainments more broadly. And just like nowadays, it's likely that the majority of leisure time was spent in more general forms of relaxation than just sports and games with things like eating, drinking, singing, gossiping, and, of course, sexual intimacy sitting at the forefront. But we can get back to our topic by considering the activity that turns anything in life into a game. Gambling. The idea of gambling on an outcome with someone else is at least as old as the written record, and my guess, certainly almost even older than that. And by the time we start hearing about gambling in ancient Sumer, it's already well developed into a variety of different forms. They made dice from the wrist and knuckle bones of animals, both four- and six-sided, and could roll them and gamble on the result, much like modern dice games, or these dice could be used in other activities. Most curiously, Gambling and divination seem to have been linked in certain ways, which does sort of make sense, as both are seen as activities with seemingly unrelated outcomes developed by the natural human tendency to abstract events into ideas and to see cause and effect all over the place. Just imagine, you and I are throwing dice. If I roll a six, you're going to buy me the next round of beer. How are the dice and the beer related? They aren't, except in the abstract sense of the social system that we've just created. We've made an agreement. That's the connection. The dice and the beer, completely independent. Now, if I'm a diviner, 
rolling dice for prognostication, a six might indicate that the client will suffer from ill fortune. Or maybe it's some pattern in the oil or the flight of the birds that will indicate this ill fortune. How are these little earthly things related to ill fortune? That, well, I mean, directly speaking, even a diviner would tell you they're not. It's only in the abstract. They're putting causes and effects together on a very high level. They're thinking, oh, here's bad luck in the dice. Oh, there's going to be bad luck more generally. There must be a, a wave of bad luck coming in. Or, in a more Mesopotamian context, the gods have decreed ill fortune here. The gods must have decreed quite a lot of ill fortune just in general. These matters of chance are all governed solely by the gods, both matters of chance in your life and matters of chance on the dice, on the flight of birds, on the whatever you have. I think it's clear enough how a line could be drawn, then, from fortune-telling to gambling. And conversely, gamblers do seem like obvious clients for fortune-tellers, what with their burning need to know future events. And so it's perhaps unsurprising that the two should come to have a good deal of overlap in the ancient world. While we only know about these games from scattered mentions and have no idea of the details, many common gambling games featured elements of the divine, such as a board game that included the 12 zodiac signs and dice rolls that were said to have implications beyond the immediate game and into the general fortunes of one's life, and games that seem to have centered around drawing lots out of a jar, which lean perhaps away from fun and towards a mix of pure gambling and divination, but it's sort of like having a lottery. And if you pick out one stick, you win the, the prize. And if you pick out another stick, eh, you're going to get cancer. It's not a fun lottery, but I'm, you know, I don't know. I'm not a lottery guy. Other people are lottery guys. It's fine. But not all gambling was a sacred attempt to divine the future. Much of it, and perhaps most of it, was simply a way to pass time and lose money. Anything could be gambled on, from a foot race to a dice roll to the outcome of events in the world. Even wars were apparently wagered on, though the one mention I know of with this talked of it in a disapproving way. Indeed, much of what we know about gambling comes from people condemning it. Proverb collections and words of wisdom tend to recommend against gambling. Those, these wise words don't seem to have reduced the amount of gambling very much. We do know from excavations of drinking establishments that gambling and alcohol were popularly, if perhaps unwisely, mixed, with caches of dice and tokens found alongside beer jars and drinking cups. Now, these tokens may have been playing pieces for games that we have no idea what they're about. Or, some think they could have been chips, representing a certain amount of money, passed around much like poker chips at a poker table, which, curiously, would, I think, make them the oldest known form of coinage. Though if this was the case, no one managed to take the idea out of the beer hall and into the marketplace until the Iron Age. But it wasn't just simple events like dice rolls and foot races that could be the subject of gambling. The ancient Mesopotamians developed sophisticated board games as well. Now, they're not the oldest, at least not known to be the oldest officially. That honor does go to the Egyptian board game Senate. But our Mesopotamian games are not far behind. There appear to have been two primary kinds of board games one with 81 spaces that seems to have included certain fortune-telling elements to it, though the details of those are completely lost, and one game that we actually have enough detail to discuss in depth. The so-called Royal Game of Ur. You'll also see it called 20 Squares in certain places. The history of the game, which I should say almost certainly wasn't called either of the things that we've named it here, 
though the original name has been lost to time, so we just call it the Royal Game of Ur, is one of the most curious coincidences of ancient history and archaeology. Now, archaeologists first found a distinctive game board, along with four throwing rods and 14 game tokens, buried alongside a noble in the city of Ur, who must have been a big fan of the game. Now, because this board was really nice and found in Ur, that's why they call it the Royal Game of Ur, this board was extremely ornate, made of very fine stone, lapis lazuli, shell, and bone, and was as much a treasure as it was a game set. Think of like those chess boards made out of actual ivory and ebony. That's the sort of thing we're looking at here. But despite the royal name and the quite fancy boards that, we, that have been found and are on display in various museums around the place, we know that this was a game for all walks of life, and have found much simpler clay boards, as well as boards scratched like graffiti, just, you know, just scratched into walls and floors, played by people who could apparently afford a little more than sticks to draw and pebbles to mark their pieces. Now, for a long time, nothing was known of this game. There are perhaps only three places where anyone was found to have written anything about this game, though one of them was a king of the Second Isan dynasty in Babylon, who we'll be looking at as we get back into Season 2 of the show, who was using the game as a fortune-telling device, believing that landing on certain squares foretold particular fortunes. The other two documents, and I should say these two documents are a thousand years apart, told us that the game was extremely popular for at least 3,000 years, and that it was, at heart, a racing game. Still, the rules were only speculation until the most remarkable thing happened. Now, very few people are board game researchers. Not a lot of demand for that kind of thing. And it's a fellow named Irving Finkel who did most of the initial work on rediscovering the royal game of Ur. He was a conventional archaeologist, but, you know, he had this sort of interest in this game that had been found. Now, with the foundation of the modern state of Israel in 1948, it seems that Finkel went over there to continue his research, mostly into ancient, you know, normal archaeology. And, at the same time, with the great migration of Jewish communities from around the world into Israel, he encountered some women who were from southern India playing a game called Asha, which looked remarkably similar to the royal game of Ur. As Finkel investigated, he found that this Jewish community in India had fled from Persia during the Islamic invasions, and before that had been in Persia ever since the time of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which had taken over from the Babylonians. The Babylonians, of course, had been the one to originally exile the Jews from Israel. And so this small, insular Jewish community had taken at least one part of the Mesopotamian lifestyle, this game, and preserved it through 2,500 years, a little bit more, uh, and preserved it only for it to be rediscovered right as that particular community was dying out thanks to the melting pot that was Israel. And the original form of the game was being rediscovered. From the way Asha is played, Plus the two fragments discussing the game, Finkel was able to determine the general outline of how it was played. Now it's important to note that with a game lasting thousands of years, like straight up we have 5,000 years of history from the very oldest burials in Ur all the way to these Jewish women in Israel, there, there was plenty of variation in how this game was played. The details almost certainly changed. We know that there are at least a few variants of the standard board. Some had special spaces marked, some had even different numbers of squares or different arrangements of some of the squares. But what seems like a pretty standard version has emerged nowadays. Now the board itself is odd. At the bottom you have a 4x3 block of squares. 
and at the top you have a 2 by 3 block. And these are connected with a neck of two squares right in the middle. I'll include some pictures to help you out over on oldeststories.net if my descriptions are a bit hard to follow. Anyway, this forms three columns. Your column, then the common column in the middle, and then on the far side is the opponent's column. Of course, it's not the far side for him. Your side is the far side for your opponent. That's how it goes. The important part is the common column is the one that goes all the way through, connecting the two sections. You begin by throwing dice. Though it seems that while you could simply use one numbered die, preferably a four-sided one, the most common way to do this was rather different. Imagine that you have four sticks, each with one side colored and the other side plain. Or perhaps imagine having four four-sided dice, but instead of having numbers on them, each one has two vertices colored and two left plain. Or, in modern terms, imagine that you have four coins, where heads is colored and tails is left plain. Essentially, you have four items that either grant you a one or a zero. You roll them and throw them, and depending on how each one lands, you either get one or nothing. Then you add all your ones together, and you get a value somewhere between zero and four. This value is the number of spaces that you can move your playing token forward on the board in that turn. And before we get too far off from that, note that this multiple stick method gives results different than a single four-sided die would. Thinking about the combinations, 0 and 4 are, mathematically speaking, the least likely rolls, while 2 is the most common roll. With a four-sided dice, uh, not only would you not have any 0, you'd just have 1, 2, 3, and 4, but also on a standard die, each side has the exact same probability of coming up. Now, it's an open question whether they understood this in a systematic way, as they don't appear to have had any formal statistics or probability mathematics that we know of. But, I mean, surely the regular players were intuitively aware of this little quirk of things, even if they never standardized or formalized it in a way that we've discovered written down. Once your role... If your result is zero, you just lose your turn. You can't move your guy. You have zero. But any result from one to four allows you to move one of your seven pieces on to the board. If this is the first turn, you have no pieces on your board, and your roll allows you to bring your first piece out, and then you don't know, move it however many, however many uh, moves you got from your roll. The board is a pair of tracks, and your track begins at the top square of the bottom block, the 4x3 block on your column. Now, as you roll, your piece moves down four squares to the bottom row, and then its next move is across to the middle column. Once it's in the middle column, it travels eight squares up the middle column, not all at once, of course, just as you roll, until it reaches the top row. And then its next move is back into your column, where it travels down two more squares, then on the next move it can escape the board. This, ultimately, is the goal of the game, to have all seven of your pieces travel this path and escape the board before your opponent can manage this. At the heart, this is a simple enough game of chance. It takes 12 moves per piece, or 14 if you count entering and exiting the board as an extra move, and with 7 pieces, that's 84 or 98 total moves. Basically, you're rolling the dice and counting to 84. Except that there are three wrinkles that make this game interesting. The first is that while you and your opponent both have a safe column in which you can move your pieces however you want, the middle column is shared by both of you and contested. If I have a piece in the middle column and your piece lands on it, my piece has to return back to my hand. I have to try again on some other turn to get it back on the board. 
Additionally, with every roll of the dice, you either have the option to either move one of the pieces you already have on the board, or to bring out another piece if you have the space for it to come out. This lets you hide your own pieces in your safe column and pick which piece will take which roll. Maybe I have one piece that's three away from taking an opponent's piece, and so if I roll a three, I'll move that one. But otherwise, if I don't get that three, I might bring some other piece in or perhaps move another one forward that's in danger of getting captured by the opponent. This is the heart of the game's strategy. For each roll of the dice, which piece should I move to advance along the path, safe from the opponent's pieces, and with the chance to hit his pieces in return? And then, to add yet another wrinkle to the proceedings, many of the boards we've found, even impromptu boards sketched out on the floor, have a handful of special squares. Now, what these special squares were is unclear. It had been proposed that these could be safe spaces where your piece can't be taken, or perhaps they grant an extra turn to the player who lands on them, or they could represent something to do with gambling, like maybe landing here allows you to take a portion of the pot of bets. These special squares are not consistent from board to board, though there is a most common configuration with two at the bottom of each player's column and another right at the bridge. These special places seem to have had special meaning outside the game as well, as those who use the game for fortune-telling may have had even more specially marked squares with more possible outcomes, that is, special squares with different effects. Some of the squares are marked in different ways on certain boards. Um, and both within the game, this would have different effects, and with respect to foretelling the future, this might have an effect. Now, whatever these special squares did, it's likely that this was the aspect of the game that changed most often over the thousands of years and thousands of miles that it was played. We have evidence of the royal game of Ur from Anatolia and the Levant all the way to India in the ancient world. And as it was passed from one friend to another, from parent to child across generations and merchant to merchant across cities, it certainly morphed and shifted. Meaning that the quest for some single objective rule set is really probably misguided in the first place. Different numbers of pieces, different numbers and types of dice, different special squares, even different board configurations are all likely. However, if you're thinking that this might be a fun game to pass the time or to be social with friends and family, this flexibility is your greatest ally. If you have a pocket full of coins and a piece of paper, you can play the royal game. If you have some pebbles, some sticks, and some dirt you can draw in, you can play one of the oldest known board games. And if you have a high-tech cellular telephone device with access to more information and entertainment in seconds than could have been found in all of ancient Babylon, there are a number of apps you can download, many for free. Just make sure you look for the distinctive shape of the game board, because just searching for Royal Game of Ur, at least when I do it, gets me a number of unrelated results mixed in. With those apps, though, I've downloaded a few, and they're mostly nice, and they let you play against the computer in your spare time, which is nice. I like things that are nice. But I would strongly recommend that once you get a sense of the basic rules, it's really simple. I'm going to post some up on oldeststories.net for you. You should put your phone down and you should give it a try for real with another person. The game is simple enough that there is plenty of space for social interaction and still deep enough for a good bit of excitement. Like I said, I said to my wife while I was doing research for this episode, I said, hey, do you want to play the world's oldest board game? And she said, Ew, that sounds like a terrible idea. But by the time she'd finished saying no, I'd already drawn out the board and was pulling coins out of our change jar. She got five dimes as markers, I got five pennies. We cut it down from seven to five. We were in, you know, not a hurry, but 
not not a non-hurry either. And we used four nickels as dice. Heads were one, tails were zero. It took less than a minute to explain everything. We were having fun rolling nickels like dice and pushing the pieces around. And this is something that's missing from a lot of people's lives nowadays. And maybe I just hang out with the wrong sort of people, but games nowadays often tend towards the complex and antisocial. Can you even imagine describing the full rule set of something like Assassin's Creed or Civilization or one of the other major video games nowadays in the ways you'd have to describe it if it was a board game? Like Skyrim, the board game. You didn't be a book. Look at these massive board games with rule books longer than novels. Or the tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, which can turn into novels themselves and... And you know, I'm, I'm just as much a part of this as society in general. I play video games. I even play Warhammer, a, a tabletop game, where I've spent a few hundred hours just building and painting little toy soldiers just to get ready for the game. And I, I do love the complexity, the hours of zen spent badly painting little aliens with plasma rifles and the long process of deciding what army I should bring to the fight, and the hours it takes to complete a single match with a single opponent. And you know, I enjoy all these modern entertainments, but there's something about the immediacy of the old game of Ur, and really about all the games and pastimes of the world before very recently, which has begun to disappear just in the lifetimes of people living right now. Something social, something intimate, for engaging in this sort of friendly competition, holding the attention of another person for the duration of a game. It doesn't even matter, really, what the task you're doing is, and the Royal Game of Ur is simple enough that it, honestly, could be replaced with any similarly simple game and still accomplish the most important social and entertainment tasks needed of it. I don't think I'm making too much sense here. I'm getting far too wishy-washy. But the point is that I've emphasized throughout this show that the people of ancient Mesopotamia were in many ways exactly like us. Biologically, mentally, they, were, they had the same brains that we had. They had the same souls, if you like. They had, you know, similar bodies. And yet, at the same time, they're extremely alien to our own ways of thinking and living, both from the incredible poverty present even at the king's palaces, compared to even a modern, modest home, from the very non-modern ways of thinking about women and magic and the world as a whole. And as it stands, we as a society are at the cusp of losing something else from the old world, these old sorts of games, in favor of electronic and massively complicated replacements. Is that a bad thing? I don't, I don't know. I certainly play the modern sort of game far more than the ancient type. Probably would never have played the royal game of Ur if I wasn't doing it for a show. But it's undoubtedly a different thing. Anyway, that is far more than enough of my nonsense, and this little bonus episode has gone on far longer than I expected. Though I have looked at a number of games and entertainments today, you should not walk away from this episode with the sense that I've just described everything they did. Or even that everyone in all of Mesopotamia knew and enjoyed the same sets of games. Not only did the games themselves vary over time, it's almost certain that in different places there were other games, as yet unknown to modern archaeology. Games invented perhaps spontaneously by children, or games passionately pursued by large groups of idle men and women. Maybe there were even citywide sports leagues. We don't really know. And of course, the Epic of Gilgamesh itself reminds us that no matter how popular a game could be, it would always have detractors, such as when the women of that city got frustrated with Gilgamesh spending all day playing games with the men and exhausting the young men so much that they didn't have time or energy to come home and be proper husbands for these wives. 
In matters of culture, far more than anything else, variation was the name of the game. Now, even though I've just sat here and recorded what turned out to be much longer than expected, this show does remain on hiatus, and I don't really know what I'll be able to post next, but to the extent that I have spare time, I'm going to try and get, you know, dribs and drabs out every second week or so, at least, is my target. Remember that the question and answer episode will mark the start of season two, and there's still plenty of time to submit your questions about the ancient Near East, or about podcasting, or really whatever you'd like to hear answered, over at oldeststories.net. Whatever comes out next episode, I hope you'll continue to find it interesting. Thank you for your patience as my life continues to turn itself upside down, and thank you for listening.